Do you want to save money at the grocery store, eat more organic, whole foods, cultivate food security, and feel more connected to the earth? If so, then growing your own food is a no-brainer. You wouldn't believe how many people come to me claiming that they can't grow their own food. They think they don't have enough space, that they're too busy, or that they simply don't have what it takes. Perhaps you've fallen for one of these gardening myths. If you think you can't grow food, or if you think the only food that you have access to is what you buy in the grocery store, I have a life-changing webinar that you need to see. It's free and will help you unearth your inner gardener. I've helped thousands of people just like you learn to grow their own food, and I'm speaking from my own experience when I say that with the right knowledge in place, there is no such thing as a black thumb. With this webinar, you can begin making your garden dreams come true and start growing delicious, nutritious food for your family. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to IWANTTOGARDEN.COM and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Remember, that's GARDEN to 44222 or IWANTTOGARDEN.COM. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Willow Blessing Aldridge, who is the daughter of one of our previous guests and an amazing young woman in her own right, and she's here to talk about raising quail. Willow is 15 years old and already running three businesses. She is a second-year college student and still in high school. She is the daughter of Cricket Aldridge, who runs GardenVariety.life, a suburban homesteading blog, and Arizona Backyard Beekeepers. Willow's first business is Blessings pet sitting, which she has run for the last six years. Hmm, that means she started it when she was nine. That's a resourceful young lady. Then she started Arizona Desert Quail, in which she raises quail for meat, eggs, and hatchlings. And Willow just started a new business with her friend Athena called Two Blonde Chicks, where they raise chickens, guinea fowl, and pheasants for meat and eggs. Welcome to the show today, Willow. Thank you, Greg. Absolutely. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Well, I, as he said, started around six years ago when I was nine. Mm -hmm. I, I grew up in a family of sort of entrepreneurs. So my dad is the owner and boss of his own company. Uh So I was used to being around people who ran their own businesses and Mm. I thought I could make my own money myself. So that's when I started pet sitting because I loved animals and I was homeschooled for about seven years. So I was home a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then think back in February is when I decided to start with quail because we had already had chickens and I thought it would be fun to start with quail. Uh And a little bit later on, I... Uh, started two blonde chicks, which includes more birds. <laughs> there you go. I was recently at your house and we chatted and you told me this story. So I know that there's a fun story behind this. How did you convince your parents to let you raise quail? Well, I decided to create a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> since that is one of the only ways I can get to my parents is uh-huh. through a professional presentation. I dressed up in a suit. I got all ready and I listed all of the pros and cons, the Uh prices and what I believe that I could make out of it for a profit. Uh And so it took a couple, maybe about a week and it was posted on Facebook and a lot of people were trying to get me to be able to get my quail and my parents said yes. And (laughs) I think it was a week to two weeks after I told my mom, Hey, I've got a brooder ready. Can we get some tomorrow? And she's like, sure. So that's how I started. Wow. So why quail? Well, I, we've already had chickens and they're, they're a pretty big bird. And I learned that quail 
don't take up a lot of space. Mm, right. And that, I mean, they develop really fast. So it's really easy to grow them and then be able to butcher them in mm-hmm. eight weeks, six to eight weeks. And they lay starting really fast. And I thought I thought they were going to be a little bit quieter, but they're not. <laughs> they, they were. They were quite noisy when I was over there that oh, day. Oh, they were. They're yeah. noisy all night as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. So the pathway from raising a little peeper chick quail to putting it on your plate. Tell me about that. Well, I mean, the process is pretty simple. You put them in a brooder so Mm -hmm. they can grow up. And once, once they're old enough to withstand the temperatures outside and now that it's warmer in Arizona, it's a Uh lot easier for them to be able to go outside earlier. Mm -hmm. Once they're big enough to be able to stand on the cage that I have because it's it's wired so it's not it's not super easy for their little uh, hands to go through Mm -hmm. so uh, once once they're old enough to go outside I put them in a bottom section of my cage it's three it's three sections the top is for the males the middle for the females and the bottom is for the new ones oh and after a while I end up integrating each of the birds into the gender that they need to go into. So mm-hmm. the gender cage of the females are in the middle and the males are at the top. And usually before I put the males in the top one is when I take the males that I have in there and butcher them because they tend to be more aggressive. Ah. So when I put other birds in there, they they like to uh, peck. And I've had uh, lots of issues with pecking eyes. Oh. Yeah. And then, I mean... They start laying pretty fast. My younger mm-hmm. ones started laying actually the day you came. And oh, it wow. was completely unexpected. They were younger than I thought that they were going to be to lay. Mm-hmm. Since my other ones took about eight weeks, these ones took six. And wow. Wow. so that was that was pretty incredible. And then once you feel that the males are ready or when you want to move your babies into the other cages mm-hmm. is when you decide to butcher. Yeah. So... I'm a vegetarian these days, and I wasn't three or four years ago, and I decided to raise some meat birds from chick to plate, where I, Mm -hmm. you know, I got them as little one-day-old peepers and, uh, you know, raised them up for eight weeks and then butchered them and put them on my plate and ate them. And Mm -hmm. for me, that was quite the process of going from, okay, I'd never really killed anything before mm-hmm. to, you know, butchering a chicken. How was that for you as a 14, 15 year old? Well, I grew up a vegetarian. Mm-hmm. I didn't really, I mean, I tried meat here and there, but I didn't really eat meat until this year. It's not that I was so concerned over the fact that they were being butchered improperly or treated improperly. It's that I never developed the taste for it. Mm-hmm. I I grew up kind of in an area where I'm used to blood. I know that sounds terrible, but mm. uh, I was used to watching uh, veterinary surgeries. Oh. And so blood never really bothered me. So it wasn't butchering that bothered me either. Mm-hmm. But I thought that it'd be really neat if I would if I knew that I was capable of being able to do that. So, and I have, I have this kind of motto that if I, if I butcher something then I'm going to eat it. So if I go fishing and I catch a fish, Uh then I'm going to eat it. Mm -hmm. If I kill a chicken, I'm going to eat it. Same with quail and any other animal. Yeah. Wow. So at 15 years old, where did you come up with that ethic at? So I think it was more of not that it was knowing where it came from, but, still being able to do it myself. And I'm a very independent person. So Mm -hmm. doing things myself makes it all the more valuable for me. So when I butcher something, it's way easier for me to be able to eat it knowing that I did it. Got it. Wow. That's pretty brave of you. Thank you. Yeah. So tell us a story about Chad. All right. So I got Chad when he was a day old. Mm Mm-hmm. And I never name my quail because that that creates a connection that I don't want in the future. Mm -hmm. I only named this bird because he, which is actually she now, Mm -hmm. was having issues developing. It was always smaller than the rest of his peers. Mm -hmm. And his feathers began to grow in really odd and crooked. And Hmm. 
So I thought he'd be able to grow a little bit more. So I decided to leave him in there and see what happened, but he really didn't. And I started to notice that he was limping. So I took a closer look and noticed that his left leg was pretty much useless. He couldn't move it. He couldn't Hmm. use it to walk on anything. Mm -hmm. And his wings didn't work either. He wasn't able to open them or close them. And it seemed to cause him a little bit of discomfort. Uh Uh-huh. So in that case, normally I would butcher it Mm -hmm. because, you know, that kind of situation isn't something you want a quail to have to live through or any animal actually. Yeah, exactly. But I thought that this would be a good time for me to see if there was something I could do about it. So I did a little bit of research as to nursing quail and seeing how they would react to different forms of care, Mm -hmm. special need care. Mm Mm-hmm. And I came up with a plan. He actually ended up coming to school with me for about a week and a half. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah, because he didn't move, so it didn't matter. So I'd get my little napkin out. He'd Uh sit on my napkin at my desk, not even move. He'd just sit there. And he would get watered every, I think it was every hour to two hours. Uh And the water had lots of vitamins in it. I had a special drop that I got. And it had tons of different kinds of vitamins and electrolytes in it. Wow. And so I would hand feed, or hand water him that every couple hours, mm-hmm. and then he would get his special food. It was it was just ground up because it was a little bit easier for him because right. he was smaller. Yeah. And then I created a bird therapy session, which was really odd for a lot of people to be able to see because I would have to do it while I was at school. I did about three times a day, right. once in the morning afternoon and then before I went to bed and that included me holding out his wings which was a little bit uncomfortable for him but Mm -hmm. he it forced him to contract his wings which we did that multiple times and that helped him build muscle in his wings and then I would hold him with two fingers right under his breast and slowly lower as I walked forward and it would force him to have to walk which would build muscle in his left leg oh yeah And at the same time, during, I think it was about two, two and a half weeks we did that, he was getting probiotics in the morning through yogurt. Uh Uh-huh. And that was a lot of protein in there as well, which was really good for him. Right, exactly. And now he lives, or she, lives in a table cage that's in our garden Uh with a orphaned rabbit that I actually <laughs> actually got. I put them in together since I was like, oh, baby and baby not doing well. So I stuck them together and they would cuddle every single night. Wow. And now Chad is pretty much completely healed, has mm-hmm. full function of his left leg and wings. It is amazing. Wow. How cool is that? So and the rabbit's name is? Pinecone. Pinecone. So you also took Pinecone to school, yes? Yeah. Pinecone was about maybe 13 to 15 days when I got him. Mm-hmm. And that's a, I think it's a cottontail rabbit. Yeah. And that one ne- needed bottle fed. So I went to the store and got some kitten formula. Oh. And I mixed that with a little bit of cream. Mm-hmm. And that's what the bunny got for about a week and a half until we started moving him to vegetables Uh and different types of feed, but they live together. Yeah. Obviously they live and cuddle together. Yeah, they do. I actually put another bird who wasn't feeling super well in that cage. And the moment it saw the bunny, it freaked out. And the moment Chad saw the bird, it freaked out. It was the funniest thing. (laughs) Wow. Wow, wow. So what kind of high school do you go to? I go to an agricultural school. So uh, we have lots of programs for yeah. agri-science, agribusiness. We have equine science, veterinary science. Mm-hmm. And we've got we've even got horses and goats in the back. Oh, wow. How yeah. cool is that? How cool is that? All right. So what I really want to get into is how do you raise quail? So... Do you start with eggs or do you start with baby quail? Well, for the last two batches that I've had, I've started with babies because I didn't have my incubator. Mm -hmm. And 
now is the first time I've started with hatching from eggs, which has proved to be a little bit complicated for me. Mm. But normally I started with just the babies and they they develop pretty fast, like I said earlier. So it's easier for me to get them into their cages and get moving. Right. These birds don't require a lot of maintenance unless you don't have waters that water them themselves, yeah. which we just installed, which I'm very happy about. Oh, nice. Uh-huh. They go through a lot of water really fast. And when they're younger, with the water, you have to be super careful that they don't fall into it because oh. they they have been known to fall into even small puddles of water and die. And die and drown. Wow. So I put... I put rocks from our yard in my water so they have oh, perfect. little tiny areas where they can drink out of and the rocks add a lot of minerals to their water as yep, well. Exactly. And so that's that's pretty easy for them. You have to clean out their cage pretty often, mm -hmm. their brooder box. That's probably a daily job, huh? Uh, depends. I I used to do it once a day and then I slacked and did it like once every 2 days. Mm -hmm. But they don't, they don't need it all the time. It just depends on how many birds you have. Right. I've had 20 at a time, and I've had 10 at a time. Mm -hmm. So it kind of all depends. So if we're starting from scratch, and we have a, an incubator, and we have some quail eggs, what next? Well, I usually get my eggs off of eBay, but I have bred my own really? quail to get their eggs. Yeah. Wow. They actually, they're pretty nice. That's where I got my pheasants and my guinea fowl. Mm -hmm. But I got about 42 eggs from eBay, and I bred some of my own quail and stuck three in there mm -hmm. just to see the difference. Before you put them in your incubator, the best thing to do is to let them sit for about 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And they have to be pointy and down. That is the one mistake that I made at first is I did not do pointy end down. Oh. So once you've let them sit for the 24 hours, then you can put them in. And I have an incubator with an automatic turner, so I don't have to turn them myself. Right. And with the, you can either have an incubator with a fan or with one without a fan. Mm -hmm. And I have one without a fan, with which changes the temperature inside the incubator, which I also did not know. Oh. And so with a fan, it's... I believe 99.5 degrees and without a fan, it's 102 degrees. Right. It's warmer. And so I don't have a fan. So mine stay at 102 degrees mm -hmm. and they go from about day one to day 17 is the hatch time. And on day 13, I believe, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's 13 or 14. Right. You put them into lockdown. So you take out the turner and you put the eggs in and you close it. And at that point, you cannot open it until they hatch. Really? Why not? And usually, because of the temperature and the humidity uh -huh. changes inside the incubator. Uh -huh. So you're supposed to leave it closed after you fill it with water again just to make sure the humidity is up. Right. And the longest the birds can stay inside without opening it after hatch is 72 hours. Oh, wow. So you've got 72 hours to wait until they hatch and then you can take them out or you can take them out really fast when they're dry. Right. So that's, that's pretty much all there is for incubating. Mm -hmm. And then? Well, after that, once they're dry, you put them in the brooder and they do stay there until they're old enough and they can withstand the temperatures outside. Ah, uh, got it. So the and brooder's inside. Yeah, the brooders inside. Mm -hmm. I have a room specifically for all my birds, the incubation and the brooders. But what I do is I I use the incubator inside. It stays heated. Mm -hmm. And then I remove it and I put the brooder inside the garage where it's a little bit cooler. Right. Not anymore. But during the winter, it's a lot cooler. So then uh -huh. I stick it out there. So they're gradually lowering the temperatures in there so they can become accustomed to it. Mm -hmm. And then I take off the heating lamp. And see how they do. Usually I put it on at night, but leave it off during the day. Right. And then I take them outside during the day and put them inside at night. Hmm. And then when they're about three weeks, to, or three to four weeks, I put them outside in the cage. Wow. And and so the cage where they live, that, that was a unique cage. Um, yeah. Something you built? Uh, I... I came up with the idea and my dad built it. Oh, He's nice really guy. good with building things. Uh -huh. So that is something that I 
made myself like I created the idea of it uh-huh. after walking into the garage and seeing a shelf thinking hey I could make I could make a cage out of that yeah so yeah. it's it's like three stories right mm-hmm. yeah so tell, tell if if I, if you were standing in front of the in front of your quail cage what does it look like well it looks kind of like a shelf from Home Depot but with kind of cages around it. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's wiring around the cages. And then I have two doors, one that's bigger and one that's smaller. Ah, right. And the smaller one blocks the bigger one. So I can always open the smaller one Mm -hmm. if I need to, but leave the larger one closed Mm -hmm. to prevent birds from coming out. Oh, right. Of course. And there's a section where I have the raised fence on the bottom. And then I have another slit of wood underneath so I can pull that out and just dump it out when I want to clean Uh, it out. So that's for cleaning the... Yeah, it makes it super easy. Yeah. And there's only, there's only three cages. I could have added four, but I thought I'd leave an extra space underneath all of the birds Mm -hmm. to give room for different things if I wanted to put my feed under there or anything. Yeah. Wow. Cool. So what do you feed the quail? I feed them the game bird feed. Mm Mm-hmm. And that has 30% protein. I was going to say, that's higher protein, right? Yeah, quail have to be fed a higher protein Mm -hmm. than chickens. So I can't use like chicken scratch as a diet for the quail. It's not good for them. Yeah. Uh, So anywhere between, I think it's 22 and 30% protein is the best. Mm -hmm. But you should always have as high as you can get it. Right. Yeah. Wow. And so are there any special considerations for housing for the quail as opposed to chickens? They need they need a roof because they can fly. They are they're birds. They kind of fly like chickens though, so they can't fly super high, but they can fly. Uh huh. They also jump quite a bit. So what I have to do is keep the cages lower to their heads because they they'll try to fly in there. And I had that issue with one in my brooder mm. that decided to fly early and it jumped and I think it like twisted its neck or something. Mm. So. The bird is always with a tilt in its head. It never bothered it. I always checked it. We move it around to see if it hurt the bird, but it didn't. So that bird is still still laying eggs. Mm-hmm. But that's why you need to keep a lower ceiling on them so that they Got don't it. fly and hurt their neck or they can even kill themselves that way. Yeah. So, you know, at 15, you still don't know everything about raising quail and pheasants and guinea fowl. Where are you learning your you know, how to do this? Well, I joined a Facebook group or multiple quail Facebook groups Mm -hmm. and ended up connecting with a guy named Laban. And he raises lots of quail. He has tons. Wow. And I actually bought some from him. I bought 20 from him. Mm -hmm. And... I go to him with all of the questions that I have because I know that he's super knowledgeable in, in what he does. And when I went to meet up with him, when I was buying my quail, he sat there and told my mom and I so many benefits of raising quail and different types of things you can do with their eggs. And he even was showing me stuff about how he butchers them. And I ended up contacting him for questions about butchering and questions about incubating. So when I have a question or a hurt quail, Mm. I usually ask him, what do I need to do? What can I do? Uh, What should I do? Yeah. 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 Cool. So he's here in the Phoenix area. Yeah. He's, I think he's a little bit more towards uh, Buckeye. Yeah. Perfect. A little bit further. So you actually reminded me of a question I haven't asked you yet. And, So you're actually raising the quail, not for just the meat, but also for the eggs. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you do with the eggs? Well, with the eggs, I am currently getting a little over half a dozen at the moment because I'm still waiting on some more to start laying Mm -hmm. per day. Um, yeah, per day. Uh I put, I usually, when I get them, I put them immediately in the fridge and, Sometimes I'll bring them over to my neighbors to let them try them because, you know, if you let people try something that's really good, they usually want to come back and buy it from you. (laughs) And so I let them try it out. Yeah. Yeah. And then I would start talking to people online, like through my Facebook, I would Mm -hmm. post a little ad saying that I'm selling quail eggs and that they can 
uh, contact me through any sort of PMing or my email mm -hmm. to buy some quail eggs or even quail meat from me. Right. Uh, a lot of the things that I do with my quail eggs, a lot of times I eat them because they're they're absolutely nutritious and they have more protein than a chicken egg. Wow. So they're super, they're super healthy. Mm -hmm. And I like to make lots of breakfasts with them <laughs> and nice. snacks because they're, nice. they're like little bite-sized eggs. So I like to boil them uh -huh. and I take them to school for a snack because they're super quick. Oh, perfect. So they're, they're smaller. They're what, the size of a quarter maybe? Yeah, I think it's six quail eggs equal one chicken egg. Wow. And do they taste different? A little bit. They don't they don't taste exactly like chicken eggs, but they do have the egg taste. Mm -hmm. They are a little bit sweeter. Mm. Yeah, they're super delicious. Interesting. And the meat, how does the meat taste? Well, I am not a good person to <laughs> compare meat to because I don't have a lot of experience right. with different tastes of meat. I actually really do enjoy it. I mean, I've tried chicken and I like chicken, but I think quail beats chicken. Ah, perfect. Perfect. So guinea fowl and pheasants with your friend. Tell me about that. Well, again, as bird people, we decided to start raising some more birds because variety is always more fun. And we were on eBay one day and decided, <laughs> hey, let's buy some guinea fowl and pheasants. Mm -hmm. And so we ordered them and they are due to hatch on Saturday and next Wednesday. Oh, wow. And with that, we are creating our website at the moment mm -hmm. where we will be able to sell it and blog all about our birds. We run social media accounts together for for these birds and mm -hmm. for my quail, we kind of combine a little bit of them together right? because, you know, birds, they all go together. But she, she lives in Cave Creek, kind of on a farm per se. Uh -huh. And so she has experience with uh, lots of different kinds of animals. Right. And her and I are both comfortable with the butchering process. And mm -hmm. so that's something we would like to do together. Hmm. And so we, we joined and, Two Blonde Chicks is almost <laughs> up and running. Oh, good for you. Good for you. I'm proud of you. Thank so you. how much of this are you doing on your own and how much input are you getting from your parents? Well, I pay for everything. Uh -huh. uh, I get all my money through my pet sitting uh -huh. and I get now some of my quail, but I care for my birds. Unless I'm not home and there's a situation, then my parents jump yeah, in and help. take care of them. Or when I'm gone, they take right. care of them. But other than that, the birds are all of mine. I do everything with them. I, wow. I clean everything for them. I feed them. I water them. I butcher. Mm -hmm. I collect eggs. I do all the sales and everything. That's all on me. Yeah. Wow. Good for you. Thank you. Good for you. So I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that fairy, and what you might have learned from it. Okay. So I think one of the main times that I failed was actually recently with my incubator. Mm -hmm. I attempted to hatch around 45 quail, and currently only three have hatched. Ooh. And it's a couple days late, which is expected because I had a incubator malfunction and a mm. personal malfunction uh, the first six days of trying to hatch them. Mm -hmm. I did not... I did not know the temperature difference between still air and then oh. one with a fan. And so I had them a little bit lower than they needed to be. And I also did not let them sit for 24 hours before I put them in because mm. I was super eager. I was like, Ooh, let's just get them in, you know? Right. And so for, for the overcoming this failure, I, I am planning on opening up all of the eggs oh. that are in there. I know there, I know most of them are, at least partially developed mm -hmm. uh, because I've been candling them throughout the entire process. Mm -hmm. And I know I had some that had infertility problems, but the rest, the rest were probably a problem of mine and the incubator mm -hmm. and the temperature. So when I'm hundred percent sure they're all done hatching, whatever is going to hatch, then I'll probably go in and open each egg and see which ones were fertile, which ones were not and then see which one's partially developed and right. then see which one's fully developed and yeah. try to do some research and figure out see why. What happened. Yeah. No, good for you. 
Good for you. Thanks. So a couple of things you said, letting, and you've said this twice now, letting the eggs sit for 24 hours. Why do you do mm -hmm. that? I think it's because it lets them settle after a long trip because oh. since I order them across country, mm -hmm. they go on the plane and they don't have time to settle and they're all mixed up. So I think letting them sit helps them to Perfect. settle. Perfect. And candling, what does that mean? Candling is when you take up a really bright flashlight with a special tip and you set it up against the egg so you mm -hmm. can see the development inside the egg. Oh, you actually can look inside the egg. Yeah. You can even see them moving. Oh my gosh, how cool is that? Very neat. So what do you consider your biggest success at the ripe young age of 15? Well, I think my biggest success, at least in the Arizona desert quail section, uh -huh. is becoming used to butchering. And mm, that was something yeah. that was really huge for me because I remember, let's say three years ago, I heard my mom on the phone talking about butchering with her friend. My mom won't even look at me doing it. But... Mm. I started crying because I hated even thinking about the process. Mm -hmm. And so in order for me to be able to come comfortable with the process, I started reading about it through articles online and read all different kinds of animals being butchered and how they did it. Mm -hmm. And once I became comfortable with that, I sat down and I forced myself through my first video watching one and I closed my eyes almost the entire time. And once I became comfortable with, being able to watch every kind of animal be butchered in different mm -hmm. kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. Then I met with Laven, who let me join him at Stockman's, and I watched him do a couple quail and a rabbit, and then mm. he handed me the scissors and a quail, and he's like, just do it. So oh, my gosh. I... I did one of those, or actually wow. I did a couple quail, two different ways, one with scissors and one with just my hands. Mm -hmm. And then I became comfortable with that. And a week later, yeah. I had an issue with one of my birds. And so that one had to be cold because it was injured. Mm -hmm. And then the same day, I thought I would just do a couple more. And I ended up selling all the all five of the birds that I butchered wow. that same day. Wow. That how, is my big success. How cool is that? So... You got it pretty together, girl. I want to know what I want to know what drives you. Well, one of the main things is that I know that I am providing a healthy a healthy food mm -hmm. for my own family, for myself and for other people. And with that, I know how I prepare the meat, how I butcher it, how I raise it, what I feed it, mm -hmm. and how they were cared for, and that makes mm -hmm. me a lot more comfortable in knowing that yeah. these birds are safe and healthy for other people to eat. Yeah. Good job. So I'm all about education and I have to know, is there a resource that's been influential for you in this process in your life? Well, as I said, I do lots of research online. Mm -hmm. I don't read as much, but I do lots of research through articles and YouTube. Mm. And I watched this guy, his uh, channel name is slightly rednecked. Mm hmm. And he went through the entire incubation process, and he has videos on how to ah. tell the gender of a bird, different kinds of birds. And so I watched a lot of his videos before deciding that I was going to get my quail. Mm -hmm. And I, I use him every now and again to look at a couple videos on how to do a couple things. Yeah. But the main person that I look up to and use for support is Laban, mm -hmm. the person who I mentioned earlier, yeah. who I – met through a Facebook group. He, I, I go to him with all of my questions. Yeah. He, he is just a book full of answers. Cool. Well, I'll tell you what, it's always great to have mentors. In fact, at 56 years old, I still have some mentors. So I think that's really valuable for you. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? I would say, Probably do as much research as you possibly can mm -hmm. before you decide to dive straight into something and also to find that one person that you can ask anything to. Yeah. Our mentor. Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Willow. It has been a treat getting to chat with you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. You did great, by the way. Thank you. How can our listeners get a hold of you? Through my email, mm -hmm. willowblessing at gmail.com. 
Perfect. You can find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash willow. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Do you want to save money at the grocery store, eat more organic whole foods, cultivate food security, and feel more connected to the earth? If so, then growing your own food is a no-brainer. You wouldn't believe how many people come to me claiming that they can't grow their own food. They think they don't have enough space, that they're too busy, or that they simply don't have what it takes. Perhaps you've fallen for one of these gardening myths. If you think you can't grow food, or if you think the only food that you have access to is what you buy in the grocery store, I have a life-changing webinar that you need to see. It's free and will help you unearth your inner gardener. I've helped thousands of people just like you learn to grow their own food, and I'm speaking from my own experience when I say that with the right knowledge in place, there is no such thing as a black thumb. With this webinar, you can begin making your garden dreams come true and start growing delicious, nutritious food for your family. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to IWantToGarden.com and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Remember, that's GARDEN to 44222 or IWantToGarden.com. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.